listen to the teaching of the Word of God. And we are very much privileged tonight to have one of us come to share the Word of God with us. And uh, we want to pray for our, for our sister, Minister Mary Wambua. We want to pray for our sister tonight. This is not the word I have used. <laughs> I have used the word minister. Karibu sana, Minister Mary. So that I can pray for you. Dear Father, we are so grateful that you have provided for us your ministers, your servants, whom you have prepared and you have trained. Tonight, Lord, we thank you for Minister Mary. Lord, we commend her to you. You who has called her, you have filled her with the giftings. And so, Lord, we ask that you will use her in the measure that you have prepared her tonight. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come upon her. Put the words in her mouth and in her heart so that she can speak them to your people. Behold your people, O oh God. We are your servants. Speak to us through your servant. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Our topic tonight is the Ministry of Intercession. I trust we all have our manuals, as was announced. And today we are doing lesson five. Let's turn to page 33 in our manuals. Those who have the older one, it might be a different page number. But in the new manual, it's page number 33. Are we all there so we can start together? The Ministry of Intercession. The objectives of our lesson today is to equip prayer ministers for intercessory prayer and also to bring an understanding of the various aspects of intercessory ministry. Let's start with the meaning of intercession. As our pastor book has read for us from Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30. And I re repeat that verse 30 again. The Lord said, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found none. So God is calling us, calling Christians, to stand in the gap on behalf of the land. Why? Because the land is defiled with sin. There is sin in the land. And I would ask that at your own time, read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 22. Because from verses 1 to 29, it describes the state of the nation of Israel. And as Kenya, we can also identify with a number of the issues that are mentioned in that chapter. And it provides a background of the status of the nation. For one, there was bloodshed in the land. The people were engaging in detestable practices. And even if we look at our nation like today, we also see that there's bloodshed in the nation. Sometimes we hear of tribal clashes. Sometimes we hear of ritual killings. Sometimes we hear of rape, abortion, and other vices in the land. And there are also, there's also idolatry in the land. And by idolatry, Romans 12, no, Romans chapter 1 t tells us about idolatry. When creation decides not to worship the creator, but to worship creation instead of worshiping God, that is idolatry. In this same chapter, we are told about parents not being, dis not being honored, parents being dishonored, which is against the commandments of God. Aliens, widows, and the vulnerable in society, orphans, not being taken care of, but being oppressed. 
We also read in this same chapter, that in the nation of Israel, there's sexual immorality, and also the house of Israel was called dross. The Lord said that Israel is dross to me, and that he was going to melt them. What is dross? Dross is the waste product when metals are put in the furnace. You know that metals are put in the furnace to purify them. And there's the waste product that is left that is called dross. So Israel was being called dross at this time because of the state of the nation. We also read from that chapter in the verses that Pastor Bok read for us that the leaders were compromised. Both the princes, who were the political leaders, and the, and the priests were also compromised in the nation. And there was no fear of God. They did not respect the things of God. They did not even respect the Sabbath. And as a result of that, the nation was in a bad state. And God was going to pour out his wrath, his judgment on the nation. So he came looking for a man, looking for people who would come and intercede to plead with him, to plead for mercy. And we see even in our nation such situations that attract the wrath of God. And we as a people, we are called to intercede, to stand in the gap in our nation. Intercession is also defined as a prayer that pleads with God on behalf of other people or for circumstances that need God's intervention. There's a quotation there in your manual. We're on page 33 for those who have just walked in. A quotation that says that everyone must pray and everyone must be prayed for. I know we like being prayed for, but are we praying for others? As intercessors, that's what we are called upon to do, to pray for others also. The word intercession comes from the Latin, from two Latin work, words, inter and sedere. Inter means between or among. And sedera means to pay the price and to yield or to move. Intercession, therefore, is calling upon us to be a go-between, uh, to appeal on the behalf of other people who are in need of God's intervention, to become involved in other people's lives, because we cannot pray for people unless we know what they are going through. So it's calling upon us to identify with the people who need the intervention of God so that we can pray with knowledge and understanding. And it also calls upon us to pay the price. And sometimes that price can be very costly. You recall when the children of Israel rebelled against the Lord and they made a golden calf. And they worshipped the golden calf. When Moses came down and found out what they had done, he was so upset. But he was willing to pay the price because he told the Lord, if you will not forgive these people, they have done a great sin, but if you will not forgive them, please blot out my name from the book of life. So that was the sacrifice he was willing to pay on behalf of the children of Israel. Christ is also our great example of an intercessor because in, uh, we read in Hebrews 7 that Christ is able to, to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for us. So as an intercessor, he is a go-between. And we can read that again in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. I'll not read all these scriptures. Maybe you note them down and then you can read them later on.
Christ also became involved in the lives of people. As we read the Gospels, which talk about Christ's ministry, we see Christ intervening in people's situations. Those who are sick, he healed them. We saw him feed hungry people. And we also saw him cast out demons and deliver people who are under bondage. And he also paid the great price with his own life for us all. We read that in Romans 8:34. He laid down his own life that we might be re redeemed. So we are called upon as his people, as intercessors, to imitate Christ in being a go-between, in identifying with people in what they are going through, and in paying the price. Let us turn to page 34 and go deeper into those aspects. What does it mean to be a go-between? To be a go-between is like an advocate. And some of us might, here might be advocates or have engaged with advocates. What does an advocate do? He supports a cause or a case on behalf of somebody else. So we're being called upon to a ministry on behalf of other people. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, I want us to, to read that scripture. If you could turn in your Bibles, but I'll read it from the Amplified Version. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 to 5 said, then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest. Joshua, the high priest, was representing the disobedient, sinful Israel, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, even the Lord who now and ever has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a log snatched and rescued from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. He spoke to those who stood before him saying, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to Joshua, see, I have caused your wickedness to be taken away from you and I will clothe and beautify you with rich robes, robes of forgiveness. And I, that was Zechariah said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with rich garments and the angel of the Lord stood by. So this was a case of the Lord interceding on behalf of Israel. Joshua was a, was a representative of Israel at that time. And you'll notice from your Bible, I think most of your Bibles, it says, when it's talking about the angel of the Lord, angel is actually in capital. So it was the Lord himself who was there. And he brought redemption. He, he cleansed uh, Joshua of his sin, and he was delivered and clothed him with new garments. We also read in, the, in 1 Peter 2.9 that as believers we are called as a royal priesthood. So like Joshua, we are priests in the land and priests to stand between God and man. In Hebrews 12 verse 14 and 1 Peter 1.16, we read of the requirements for us as an advocate to stand between God and man. And the requirement is for us to live holy lives. Secondly, what does it mean to get involved in people's lives? To become involved means to identify with what people are going through. Christ identified with us when he came on earth as a human being. He laid down his deity. We read that in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 7 where we are admonished, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, 
who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. In 1 Corinthians, we also read of how Paul also identified with the Corinthians that he was ministering to. He said, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those having the law, I become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but rather under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. We read a similar passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Paul tells us, and I'll read again from the Amplified Version. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we employ on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So we are Christ's ambassadors. That's why we get involved in people's lives. And I'm sure you've seen ambassadors in the political realm. They represent the head of state of the country that has sent them out. So we, as Christ's ambassadors, are sent out by Jehovah God to be involved in people's lives. As ambassadors, we are also to be involved by sharing and serving. We read in Matthew 10, verse 8, that Christ told his disciples, as you have received, freely you have received, freely give. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2, we read about the Macedonian church who had raised an offering for the needy. And it says, the Macedonian church is, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. The Corinthian church gave themselves first to the ministry and then gave their possessions. You notice the sequence there. Because if we give our possessions first, then it is just charity. But here they gave themselves first to the Lord, and the Lord enabled them to give of their possessions. In Mark 10, 45, 44 to 45, I'd like us to read that scripture. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So as intercessors, we are called to sacrifice. In this passage, it's a story which I'm sure you're well familiar with. When James and John asked to be seated on either side of Jesus in glory, and Jesus told them, you don't know what you ask because it was going to take him to put, lay down his life that he may resurrect and sit at the right hand of God the Father. So as, as Christians, we are called to serve God's people. And some people have an exceptional gift of giving, but all of us are called to give to some extent to help those who are around us. 
What does it mean to pay the price? To pay the price, first of all, we have to pay the price by wrestling in prayer. When a person, a church or a nation faces a crisis, we have to engage in spiritual warfare to destroy the forces of evil that are seeking to take over what is the situation in the nation. Just very much like we did before the elections and we continue to do because Satan does not relax. He's always looking for an opportunity whereby he can bring his agenda to bear in the nation. So we need to always be alert. The second step in paying the price is to rule. And you're all familiar with the scripture Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.10, the Lord said to Jeremiah, See, today I have appointed you over nations and over kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. So we are called to rule over nations and kingdoms. Nations are physical nations like our nation of Kenya. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, we know that in the beginning, God gave man dominion over the whole of his creation. And at the fall, we lost that, uh, that dominion. But through Jesus Christ, we have gained dominion. We have regained the dominion to rule and reign in our nations. But also, we are called upon to rule in kingdoms. Kingdoms are spiritual in nature, and we are called upon to, to fight in the spiritual realm against the principalities and powers. Let us read and refresh our minds on Ephesians 6 from verse 10. My Bible is entitled, The Whole Armor of God. So we are called upon, upon to put on the whole armor of God. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having guided your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. So we are called to engage in that battle because it is not a battle against, you might think that it is somebody in your office who is against you, but it will be a, a spiritual power behind that person who would be doing such a thing to you. So we need to pray the Lord to show us how to address each and every battle because the Lord has a, a strategy for each and every battle. So going back to the passage that we read in, in uh, Jeremiah, there are certain steps that we need to take as intercessors. Firstly, to root out. This means dealing with a problem from the roots. And we know that in many institutions, families, and nations, there are foundations that we do not see. Like for example, in this building, you can't see the foundation. You don't know whether it is good, it's bad, it's strong, it's weak. So foundations are something which you don't see. 
And if we do something superficial, if somebody says, if an architect comes and says this building is no good, you have to demolish it and start again. Sometimes it's because of the way the foundation was laid. It was not laid properly. So if you don't lay a proper foundation, then the rest of the building would be faulty and weak. Secondly, we are called to pull down. Everything that rises to oppose God needs to be pulled down. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3 to 6, we are told that we do not war in the flesh, but we war in, against spiritual forces. Let us read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we are called to pull down those strongholds that oppose God. What are some of those strongholds? Tribalism, nepotism, corruption, bigotry, sexism, and several others. We are called to pull them down. Thirdly, we are called to destroy and overthrow. By destroying and overthrowing, we are subduing or defeating the evil powers that are trying to oppose the purposes of God. And remember in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, we are, told to sub, we are called to subdue. So even in spiritual warfare, we are called upon to subdue these powers. And it's not in our own strength that we do it. It is only the Lord who can enable us. And then, fourthly, we are called upon to build and to plant. Because if we just uproot, there'll be nothing left. There was no point of uprooting if we were not going to bring to pass God's purposes in the environment. So after destroying all the powers of wickedness through the help of God, we must build and plant. Jesus in John 10.10 10, said the devil has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we see that so much around us. If you look at even the newspapers, the headline usually is something negative. It's about <laughs> stealing, killing, or destroying most of the times. There's hardly anything positive that we see. In fact, some of us don't even like listening to the news. But I'll tell you why it's important to listen to the news, because if you don't have knowledge, you won't know how to pray. So though we see all that negativity, may the Lord help us to overcome that and to build and to plant. Because Christ came, said that he came to bring life and that we may have life in abundance. So we are meant to prosper. We are meant to grow and we are meant to radiate God's glory. To build means to establish, to strengthen, to restore. There are battered, battered lives which need to be healed and people who need to be restored to their faith. To plant means to place something in a place that is suitable for growth. That's in a suitable environment to allow it to grow. So as intercessors and as shepherds of God's people, we are called upon to not only battle, and help people overcome what is holding them down, the strongholds, but also to help them to grow in the faith. As an intercessor, we are also watchmen. We read in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It's 
there in your manual, in case everybody, anybody is lost, we're on page 35 in the middle. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. So the first thing that we notice here is that God tells Ezekiel that we have to hear from the Lord. Remember the passage that our pastor Bok uh, read for us earlier, that the priests were saying the Lord has said when the Lord has not said. Let us not get involved in that, but seek the Lord, that what we speak is what the Lord has said. So firstly, we need to hear from the Lord, and then we need to speak we are there to warn people. And the nation is going in the wrong direction. We need to warn the nation of the repercussions of the judgment of God that can come upon our nation. So the watchman hears from God and reports to the nation. This is what makes intercession such a high calling. But it carries with it a weight of responsibility if we give a wrong report, we'll mislead the nation, and therefore we need to be sure that we have heard from the Lord. In Isaiah 62, verse 6, it says, Isaiah is told by the Lord, I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, that they will never be silent day and night. You will call on the Lord, Give yourselves no rest till he establishes Jerusalem. So we are called upon to be persistent in prayer, calling upon the Lord until things change. Here in this passage, the intercessors are being called upon to pray for Jerusalem. And even us as believers, we know that Israel is the firstborn of God. And the way that Israel goes, the rest of the nations will go. If Israel doesn't enter its destiny, the rest of us as nations are on hold. So even as we pray, we must also pray for Israel and for Jerusalem, that God establishes Jerusalem in the way that he wants Jerusalem to be, to be a glory in the world. When you're standing on a wall, you're high up above where people are. So you can also see far. So as intercessors, when we are on the wall of the nation, by God's help, we can see far what is coming. And if we do not warn the nation, the Lord will hold us responsible for that. So how do we develop the eye of a watchman? The first step is to sign up as a watchman. Tell the Lord that you are willing to be a watchman, for the Lord is looking for watchmen to stand on the walls of the nations. In Isaiah 6, 8, we read, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And the reply was, and I said, Here I am, send me. So as we sign up, we make a commitment to the Lord to be used of him in what he wants to do. We're also warned in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, that once we have put our hand to the plow, we should not turn back. So it's a commitment for life to serve the Lord. The second step, we need to be a keen observer of issues and events and take the matters to the Lord in prayer. This is when I was talking about the news and the newspapers. If we don't know what is happening in the nation, we won't know how to pray with knowledge and understanding. We'll just be praying general prayers. But in order for us to pay, pray effective prayers and prayers that bring results in the nation, we need to know what is happening around us. So we need to read, we need to listen, and know what is happening 
around us so that we can take those matters to the Lord in prayer. The third step, being an intercessor, we need to develop a God consciousness in our lives. Page 36 at the top. Once you sign up to be an intercessor, you're on 24 hour call, 365 days in the year. There's no time that you cannot be called for an assignment. And therefore, sometimes you'll find the, that your plans, whatever you've planned, is not, is being, so to speak, uh, interfered with. We must be flexible to the Lord once we sign up. We give up our independence, our management of our schedules, so that the Lord may use us when he needs us. And sometimes, we are called upon in very difficult situations. When we remember the story of Queen Esther in Esther chapter 2, when there was the plot to destroy the nation of Israel, the plot of Haman to destroy the people, she had to sacrifice. At first, she was not willing. But Mordecai pleaded with her and said, don't think that if you do not uh, speak up, that you your, and your father's house would be freed. So finally she agreed, and we know the fa fa uh, famous saying, she said, I'll go before the king, and if I perish, I perish. So sometimes the Lord calls us to things which you're wondering, how will I manage to do it? But with his help, you will. And you, we remember also from Hosea, the way the Lord called Hosea and told him, go and marry a harlot, because a harlot is a representation of the nation of Israel who has turned away from me and is following other gods. So God will call us to various things. So we need to be flexible. We need to be listening to what the Lord is saying. Uh, fourthly, we need to know the bitter and sweet of the word of God. The, if we can read that passage in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Ezekiel 2, 9, up to chapter 3, verse 3. It's, it says, this is Ezekiel being sent to the nation of Israel. Now when I look, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate it and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. But if we jump to verse there we see that the word of God was sweet as he ate it. But if we jump to verse 14, it says, So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So from the word of God, we see bitterness and sweetness coming out of it but we must know the word of, the God, of God and what he is sending us to do. So, so the word of God is foundational in our lives and therefore we must soak ourselves in the word of God and meditate on it day and night. Step five, we are to develop a strong and yielding character. That is an uncompromising character not fearing men and not seeking favors for men. 
because it is the Lord who grants us strength to do what he wants us to do. It is not in our own strength or out of human wisdom. So we need to continually seek him. Step number six, let the hand of God rest over your life so that you can hear what he's saying and see what he's asking you to do. There are some passages there. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 12, and verse 14, verse 22 and 24. When you read those, those uh, verses, we can read the one from chapter 1, because there's something in common in each one of them. Ezekiel 1, verse 1 to 4. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Sheba, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of God came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Cheba, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So you can see Ezekiel had this vision. And even when you read the other scriptures quoted there, it talks about the spirit of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. So when the spirit of the Lord is upon us, we are able to do what he wants us to do. In our own strength, we cannot. Seventhly, we need to develop a listening ear through the purity of heart. Uh, let us read that passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And I'd like to read it from the Amplified Version. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. Who is like the wise man? And know, who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illuminates his face and causes his stern face to beam. I counsel you to keep the command of the king because of the oath before God, by which you swore loyalty to him. Do not be in a hurry to get out of his presence. Do not join in the malevolent or evil stand in any matter, for the king will do whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is authoritative and powerful. Who will say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps and observes a royal command will experience neither trouble nor misery. For a wise heart will know the proper time and appropriate procedure. So here it's talking about a king and the king is representative of God, and God's word is authoritative and powerful. And when God gives us a command, we are to keep it and observe it. So in step seven, we, we are saying that we must develop a listening ear, and we can only develop a listening ear if we have pure hearts before the Lord. And step eight is also from the same passage that we need to develop the ability to move in God's timing. The end of in verse five of that passage we read, it says, whoever keeps and observes a royal command will experience neither trouble nor misery. For a wise heart will know the proper time and appropriate procedure. So as intercessors, we must move in God's timing and in the way that God advises us to move. Step nine, we need to continually seek an open heaven with God so that we can see and hear from him. Like the passage we, we read, as Ezekiel was, be, was beside the river Cheba, he had an open heaven and therefore he was able to see the vision that the Lord was showing him. So likewise, in our intimacy with God, 
we should seek to be able to see what God is telling us and seek an open heaven that we may hear from him. And then we need also to live a pure life. We must have a pure heart which discerns what God wants us to do and what he wants us to pray for. You know, we are not called to every battle. There are so many things happening around us, but we are not called to every battle. God chooses the battles that he wants you to fight. So you must seek the Lord so that you only go into the battles that he is calling you to go into. And for you to be able to know that, your heart must be pure so that you can hear from the Lord. In Psalms 119, from verse 9, we read, How can a young man keep his way pure? And I'm not sure that it's only talking about a young man. It's, they use young man here, but I think it is all of us. So we can say, how can an intercessor keep his way pure? By keeping watch on himself according to your word, conforming his life to your precepts. With all my heart, I have sought you, inquiring of you and longing for you. Do not let me wander from your commandments, neither through ignorance nor by willful disobedience. Your word have I treasured and stored in my heart that I may not sin against you. So our hearts need to be right with God in order for us to be able to discern what he's telling us. In Proverbs 4.23, we are told, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So let us keep our hearts pure that we may be able to serve God's purposes. And as watchmen, of course, we are called to sound the alarm. We must sound the alarm when judgment is coming upon the people, upon the nation, if we perceive that the nation is going in a wrong direction. We remember the passage in Nehemiah chapter 2. When Nehemiah got the report about how the nation of uh, how Jerusalem was destroyed, and he prayed to the Lord about it, and he fasted that he may know what he is to do in that, in that um, situation. But in verse two, in chapter two, from verse 11 to 18. We see the time when the king has released Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem. And at night, Nehemiah goes around surveying, doing spiritual mapping to find out what is the state of the walls. He had been told, yes, by his brothers, but he wanted to see for himself. And so he went out at night and he went around to see the status of the walls and then he came back. And then after that is when he approached the leaders of the city and said, we must rebuild this wall. So even as at intercessors, there are times that you're called upon to be silent. You'll just be doing things in silence. From the time Nehemiah had heard about the status of Jerusalem, he did not talk much. And even when he was going out on spiritual mapping, it was not like the people he was even with knew what he was doing. But at the appropriate time when the Lord prompted him, then he could talk to the people and said, let us build this wall that we get rid of the shame that comes upon us as a city, and this, more so the city of the Lord. The intercessor is also a prophet and speaks to the nation and speaks to people about God's impending judgment. An intercessor may receive prophetic messages from the Lord, which he is required to deliver. We remember several times about Elijah. Elijah had to approach Ahab and tell Ahab there shall be no rain, or tell Ahab what the Lord has said. So as intercessors, the Lord sends us 
to places to say, to speak on his behalf. So we need to be clear, clear with what the Lord has, has sent us to do and go and announce it to the people. It might even be to families, individuals, cities, or even nations. May the Lord help us. And we must be persistent, as I said before. We give no, God no rest until the kingdom is established on earth or until the issue you're praying about has a breakthrough. Stand before the Lord at a vantage point on the walls of the city and look into the distance with prophetic eyes, with spiritual eyes, that you may be able to see what is coming. And let us warn, because the Bible says that if we receive the revelation and we do not warn, God will hold us guilty for the blood, blood of the people that would perish as a result of that judgment. In Psalm 132, verse 3 to 5, we read that, I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep on my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord. This was David. May we partner with the Lord to set up a place for the Lord, to set up altars for the Lord, whether it's in our homes, in our families, in the church, in the nation. Let us seek the Lord and do this on his behalf, that the presence of the Lord may dwell in our midst. In Isaiah 61, and here our ends, Isaiah 61, I want us to read our job description as the people of God. And this is the same job description that Jesus Christ had and has passed on to us. Isaiah 61, from verse 1 to verse 4. Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall rise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. The desolation of many generations shall be rebuilt. So this is our job description as intercessors and people of God. We are, we are called to restore, to bring restoration in the land. There are people who are bound, who we are sent to, to help them out of their bondage. There are captives who are in spiritual prisons, who need our help to get out that may serve the Lord. And we are here to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, that God's people may be ready as a bride for his second coming. We are also called to restore the ruins, the ruins of cities, the ruins of nations. And that is what, part of what we teach in redeeming the land, to redeem things back for God's glory and for his honor. And therefore, I call upon us to reflect once more on our calling. Last week we talked about responding to our calling, and this is a continuation of that. We are called as intercessors. Are you willing? Are you ready to lay down your life as Christ did, that others may know him and live? God bless you.
The Lord bless you, every one of you, for coming tonight. And may you be a blessing to others, even those that we left at home, because we have been blessed. Let us, let us share together in the words of the grace as we end tonight. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the